Section 13 of The Aesop for Children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Aesop for Children by Aesop. The Travelers and the Sea. Two travelers were walking along the seashore. Far out they saw something riding on the waves. Look, said one. A great ship rides in from distant lands, bearing rich treasures. The object they saw came ever nearer the shore. No, said the other, that is not a treasure ship. That is some fisherman's skiff with the day's catch of savory fish. Still nearer came the object. The waves washed it up on shore. It is a chest of gold lost from some wreck, they cried. Both travelers rushed to the beach, but they found nothing but a water-soaked log. Do not let your hopes carry you away from reality. THE WOLF AND THE LION A wolf had stolen a lamb and was carrying it off to his lair to eat it. But his plans were very much changed when he met a lion, who, without making any excuses, took the lamb away from him. The wolf made off to a safe distance, and then said in a much injured tone, You have no right to take my property like that. The lion looked back, but as the wolf was too far away to be taught a lesson without too much inconvenience, he said, Your property? Did you buy it? Or did the shepherd make you a gift of it? Pray tell me, how did you get it? What is evil won is evil lost. THE STAG AND HIS REFLECTION A stag, drinking from a crystal spring, saw himself mirrored in the clear water. He greatly admired the graceful arch of his antlers, but he was very much ashamed of his spindly legs. How can it be, he sighed, that I should be cursed with such legs when I have so magnificent a crown? At that moment he scented a panther, and in an instant was bounding away through the forest. But as he ran his wide-spreading antlers caught in the branches of the trees, and soon the panther overtook him. Then the stag perceived that the legs of which he was so ashamed would have saved him had it not been for the useless ornaments on his head. We often make much of the ornamental, and despise the useful. THE PEACOCK The peacock, they say, did not at first have the beautiful feathers in which he now takes so much pride. These, Juno, whose favorite he was, granted to him one day when he begged her for a train of feathers to distinguish him from the other birds. Then, decked in his finery, gleaming with emerald, gold, purple, and azure, he strutted proudly among the birds. All regarded him with envy. Even the most beautiful pheasant could see that his beauty was surpassed. Presently the peacock saw an eagle soaring high up in the blue sky and felt a desire to fly, as he had been accustomed to do. Lifting his wings he tried to rise from the ground, but the weight of his magnificent train held him down. Instead of flying up to greet the first rays of the morning sun, or to bathe in the rosy light among the floating clouds at sunset, he would have to walk the ground more encumbered and oppressed than any common barnyard fowl. Do not sacrifice your freedom for the sake of pomp and show. End of section 13。section 14 of the Aesop for children。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Aesop for Children by Aesop The Mice and the Weasels The weasels and the mice were always up in arms against each other. In every battle the weasels carried off the victory, as well as a large number of the mice, which they ate for dinner next day. In despair the mice called a council, and there it was decided that the mouse army was always beaten because it had no leaders. So a large number of generals and commanders were appointed from among the most eminent mice. To distinguish themselves from the soldiers in the ranks, the new leaders proudly bound on their heads lofty crests and ornaments of feathers or straw. Then, after long preparation of the mouse army and all the arts of war, they sent a challenge to the weasels. The weasels accepted the challenge with eagerness, for they were always ready for a fight when a meal was in sight. They immediately attacked the mouse army in large numbers. Soon the mouse line gave way before the attack, and the whole army fled for cover. The privates easily slipped into their holes, 
but the Mouse leaders could not squeeze through the narrow openings because of their head dresses. Not one escaped the teeth of the hungry weasels. Greatness has its penalties. The Wolf and the Lean Dog A wolf prowling near a village one evening met a dog. It happened to be a very lean and bony dog, and Master Wolf would have turned up his nose at such meager fare had he not been more hungry than usual. So he began to edge toward the dog, while the dog backed away. "'Let me remind your lordship,' said the dog, his words interrupted now and then, as he dodged a snap of the wolf's teeth. "'How unpleasant it would be to eat me now! Look at my ribs! I am nothing but skin and bone. But let me tell you something in private.' In a few days my master will give a wedding feast for his only daughter. You can guess how fine and fat I will grow on the scraps from the table. Then is the time to eat me. The wolf could not help thinking how nice it would be to have a fine, fat dog to eat, instead of the scrawny object before him. So he went away, pulling in his belt and promising to return. Some days later the wolf came back for the promised feast. He found the dog in his master's yard, and asked him to come out and be eaten. "'Sir,' said the dog with a grin, "'I shall be delighted to have you eat me. I'll be out as soon as the porter opens the door.' But the porter was a huge dog whom the wolf knew by painful experience to be very unkind toward wolves. So he decided not to wait, and made off as fast as his legs could carry him. Do not depend on the promises of those whose interest it is to deceive you. Take what you can get, when you can get it. THE FOX AND THE LION A very young fox, who had never before seen a lion, happened to meet one in the forest. A single look was enough to send the fox off at top speed for the nearest hiding place. The second time the fox saw the lion, he stopped behind a tree to look at him a moment before slinking away. But the third time the fox went boldly up to the lion, and, without turning a hair, said, "'Hello there, old top!' Familiarity breeds contempt. Acquaintance with evil blinds us to its dangers. THE LION AND THE ASS A lion and an ass agreed to go hunting together. In their search for game, the hunters saw a number of wild goats run into a cave, and laid plans to catch them. The ass was to go into the cave and drive the goats out, while the lion would stand at the entrance to strike them down. The plan worked beautifully. The ass made such a frightful din in the cave, kicking and braying with all his might, that the goats came running out in a panic of fear, only to fall victim to the lion. The ass came proudly out of the cave. "'Did you see how I made them run?' he said. "'Yes, indeed,' answered the lion. "'And if I had not known you and your kind, I should certainly have run too.' The loud-mouthed boaster does not impress nor frighten those who know him. End of section 14。section 15 of the Aesop for children。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit LibriVox.org。the Aesop for children。by Aesop。the dog and his master's dinner。A dog had learned to carry his master's dinner to him every day. He was very faithful to his duty, though the smell of the good things in the basket tempted him. The dogs in the neighborhood noticed him carrying the basket, and soon discovered what was in it. They made several attempts to steal it from him, but he always guarded it faithfully. Then one day all the dogs in the neighborhood got together and met him on his way with the basket. The dog tried to run away from them, but at last he stopped to argue. That was his mistake. They soon made him feel so ridiculous that he dropped the basket and seized a large piece of roast meat intended for his master's dinner. Very well, he said. You divide the rest. Do not stop to argue with temptation. The Vain Jackdaw and His Borrowed Feathers A jackdaw chanced to fly over the garden of the king's palace. There he saw with much wonder and envy a flock of royal peacocks in all the glory of their splendid plumage. Now the black jackdaw was not a very handsome bird, nor very refined in manner. Yet he imagined that all he needed to make himself fit for society of the peacocks was a dress like theirs. 
so he picked up some cast-off feathers of the peacocks, and stuck them among his own black plumes. Dressed in his borrowed finery, he strutted loftily among the birds of his own kind. Then he flew down into the garden among the peacocks. But they soon saw who he was. Angry at the cheat, they flew at him, plucked away the borrowed feathers and also some of his own. The poor jackdaw returned sadly to his former companions. There another unpleasant surprise awaited him. They had not forgotten his superior airs toward them, and to punish him they drove him away with a rain of pecks and jeers. Borrowed feathers do not make fine birds. THE MONKEY AND THE DOLPHIN It happened once upon a time that a certain Greek ship bound for Athens was wrecked off the coast close to Piraeus, the port of Athens. Had it not been for the dolphins, who at that time were very friendly toward mankind and especially toward Athenians, all would have perished. But the dolphins took the shipwrecked people on their backs and swam with them to shore. Now it was the custom among the Greeks to take their pet monkeys and dogs with them whenever they went on a voyage. So when one of the dolphins saw a monkey struggling in the water, he thought it was a man and made the monkey climb on his back. Then off he swam with him toward the shore. The monkey sat up, grave and dignified, on the dolphin's back. "'You are a citizen of illustrious Athens, are you not?' asked the dolphin politely. "'Yes,' answered the monkey proudly. "'My family is one of the noblest in the city.' "'Indeed,' said the dolphin. "'Then, of course, you often visit Piraeus.' "'Yes, yes,' replied the monkey. "'Indeed I do. I am with him constantly. Piraeus is my very best friend.' This answer took the dolphin by surprise, and, turning his head, he now saw what it was he was carrying. Without more ado, he dived and left the foolish monkey to take care of himself while he swam off in search of some human being to save. One falsehood leads to another. THE WOLF AND THE ASS An ass was feeding in a pasture near a wood when he saw a wolf lurking in the shadows along the hedge. He easily guessed what the wolf had in mind, and thought of a plan to save himself. So he pretended he was lame, and began to hobble painfully. When the wolf came up, he asked the ass what had made him lame, and the ass replied that he had stepped on a sharp thorn. "'Please pull it out,' he pleaded, groaning as if in pain. "'If you do not, it might stick in your throat when you eat me.' The wolf saw the wisdom of the advice, for he wanted to enjoy his meal without any danger of choking. So the ass lifted up his foot, and the wolf began to search very closely and carefully for the thorn. Just then the ass kicked out with all his might, tumbling the wolf a dozen paces away, and while the wolf was getting very slowly and painfully to his feet, the ass galloped away in safety. "'Serves me right,' growled the wolf, as he crept into the bushes. I'm a butcher by trade, not a doctor. Stick to your own trade. End of section 15。section 16 of the Aesop for Children。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Aesop for Children by Aesop. THE MONKEY AND THE CAT Once upon a time a cat and a monkey lived as pets in the same house. They were great friends and were constantly in all sorts of mischief together. What they seemed to think of more than anything else was to get something to eat, and it did not matter much to them how they got it. One day they were sitting by the fire watching some chestnuts roasting on the hearth. How to get them was the question. I would gladly get them, said the cunning monkey, but you are much more skillful at such things than I am. Pull them out, and I'll divide them between us. Pussy stretched out her paw very carefully, pushed aside some of the cinders, and drew back her paw very quickly. Then she tried it again, this time pulling a chestnut half out of the fire. A third time, and she drew out the chestnut. This performance she went through several times, each time singeing her paw severely. As fast as she pulled the chestnuts out of the fire, the monkey ate them up. Now the master came in, and away scampered the rascals, Mistress Cat with a burnt paw and no chestnuts. From that time on, they say, she contented herself with mice and rats, and little to do with Sir Monkey.
the flatterer seeks some benefit at your expense. THE DOGS AND THE FOX Some dogs found the skin of a lion and furiously began to tear it with their teeth. A fox chanced to see them and laughed scornfully. If that lion had been alive, he said, it would have been a very different story. He would have made you feel how much sharper his claws are than your teeth. It is easy and also contemptible to kick a man that is down. THE DOG AND THE HIDES Some hungry dogs saw a number of hides at the bottom of a stream where the tanner had put them to soak. A fine hide makes an excellent meal for a hungry dog, but the water was deep and the dogs could not reach the hides from the bank. So they held a council and decided that the very best thing to do was to drink up the river. All fell to lapping up the water as fast as they could. But though they drank and drank until, one after another, all of them had burst with drinking, still, for all their effort, the water in the river remained as high as ever. Do not try to do impossible things. THE RABBIT, THE WEASEL, AND THE CAT A rabbit left his home one day for a dinner of clover. But he forgot to latch the door of his house, and while he was gone, a weasel walked in and calmly made himself at home. When the rabbit returned, there was the weasel's nose sticking out of the rabbit's own doorway, sniffing the fine air. The rabbit was quite angry, for a rabbit, and requested the weasel to move out. But the weasel was perfectly content. He was settled down for good. A wise old cat heard the dispute and offered to settle it. "'Come close to me,' said the cat. "'I am very deaf. Put your mouths close to my ears while you tell me the facts.' The unsuspecting pair did as they were told, and, in an instant, the cat had them both under her claws. No one could deny that the dispute had been definitely settled. The strong are apt to settle questions to their own advantage. End of section 16「Section 17 of the Aesop for Children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Aesop for Children by Aesop. The Bear and the Bees. A bear roaming the woods in search of berries happened on a fallen tree in which a swarm of bees had stored their honey. The bear began to nose around the log very carefully to find out if the bees were at home. Just then, one of the swarm came home from the clover field with a load of sweets. Guessing what the bear was after, the bee flew at him, stung him sharply, and then disappeared into the hollow log. The bear lost his temper in an instant, and sprang upon the log tooth and claw to destroy the nest. But this only brought out the whole swarm. The poor bear had to take to his heels, and he was able to save himself only by diving into a pool of water. It is wiser to bear a single injury in silence than to provoke a thousand by flying into a rage. THE FOX AND THE LEOPARD A fox and a leopard, resting lazily after a generous dinner, amused themselves by disputing about their good looks. The leopard was very proud of his glossy, spotted coat, and made disdainful remarks about the fox, whose appearance he declared was quite ordinary. The fox prided himself on his fine bushy tail with its tip of white, but he was wise enough to see that he could not rival the leopard in looks. Still, he kept up a flow of sarcastic talk, just to exercise his wits and to have the fun of disputing. The leopard was about to lose his temper when the fox got up, yawning lazily. "'You may have a very smart coat,' he said, but you would be a great deal better off if you had a little more smartness inside your head, and less on your ribs the way I am. That's what I call real beauty. A fine coat is not always an indication of an attractive mind. THE HERON A heron walked sedately along the bank of a stream, his eyes on the clear water, and his long neck and pointed bill ready to snap up a likely morsel for his breakfast. The clear water swarmed with fish, but Master Heron was hard to please that morning. No small fry for me, he said. Such scanty fare is not fit for a heron. Now a fine young perch swam near. No, indeed, said the heron. I wouldn't even trouble to open my beak for anything like that. As the sun rose, the fish left the shallow water near the shore and swam below into the cool depths toward the middle. 
the heron saw no more fish, and very glad was he at last to breakfast on a tiny snail. Do not be too hard to suit, or you may have to be content with the worst, or with nothing at all. THE COCK AND THE FOX One bright evening, as the sun was sinking on a glorious world, a wise old cock flew into a tree to roost. Before he composed himself to rest, he flapped his wings three times and crowed loudly. But just as he was about to put his head under his wing, his beady eyes caught a flash of red and a glimpse of a long-pointed nose, and there, just below him, stood Master Fox. "'Have you heard the wonderful news?' cried the fox in a very joyful and excited manner. "'What news?' asked the cock, very calmly. But he had a queer, fluttery feeling inside him, for, you know, he was very much afraid of the fox. "'Your family and mine, and all other animals, have agreed to forget their differences and live in peace and friendship from now on forever. Just think of it. I simply cannot wait to embrace you. Do come down, dear friend, and let us celebrate the joyful event.' "'How grand!' said the cock. "'I certainly am delighted at the news.' But he spoke in an absent way and stretching up on tiptoes, seemed to be looking at something far off. "'What is it you see?' asked the fox a little anxiously. "'Why, it looks to me like a couple of dogs coming this way. They must have heard the good news, and—' But the fox did not wait to hear more. Off he started on a run. "'Wait!' cried the cock. "'Why do you run? The dogs are friends of yours now.' "'Yes,' answered the fox. "'But they might not have heard the news.' Besides, I have a very important errand that I had almost forgotten about. The cock smiled as he buried his head in his feathers and went to sleep, for he had succeeded in outwitting a very crafty enemy. The trickster is easily tricked. End of section 17 Recording by Lee Smalley Section 18 of The Ease of for Children this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Aesop for Children by Aesop The Dog in the Manger A dog, asleep in the manger filled with hay, was awakened by the cattle which came in tired and hungry from working in the field. But the dog would not let them get near the manger, and snarled and snapped, as if it were filled with the best of meat and bones all for himself. The cattle looked at the dog in disgust. "'How selfish he is!' said one. "'He cannot eat the hay, and yet he will not let us eat it who are so hungry for it now the farmer came in when he saw how the dog was acting he seized a stick and drove him out of the stable with many a blow for his selfish behaviour do not grudge others what you cannot enjoy yourself THE WOLF AND THE GOAT A hungry wolf spied a goat browsing at the top of a steep cliff, where he could not possibly get at her. "'That is a very dangerous place for you,' he called out, pretending to be very anxious about the goat's safety. "'What if you should fall? Please listen to me and come down.' Here you can get all you want of the finest, tenderest grass in the country. The goat looked over the edge of the cliff. How very, very anxious you are about me, she said, and how generous you are with your grass. But I know you. It's your own appetite you are thinking of, not mine. An invitation prompted by selfishness is not to be accepted. The Ass and the Grasshoppers 
One day, as an ass was walking in the pasture, he found some grasshoppers chirping merrily in a grassy corner of the field. He listened with a great deal of admiration to the song of the grasshoppers. It was such a joyful song that his pleasure-loving heart was filled with a wish to sing as they did. "'What is it?' he asked very respectfully. "'That has given you such beautiful voices. "'Is there any special food you eat, "'or is it some divine nectar that makes you sing so wonderfully?' "'Yes,' said the grasshoppers, who were very fond of a joke. "'It is the dew we drink. "'Try some and see.' So thereafter the ass would eat nothing and drink nothing but dew. Naturally, the poor foolish ass soon died. The laws of nature are unchangeable. The Mule A mule had had a long rest and much good feeding. He was feeling very vigorous indeed, and pranced around loftily, holding his head high. "'My father certainly was a full-blooded racer,' he said. "'I can feel that distinctly.' Next day he was put into harness again, and that evening he was very downhearted indeed. "'I was mistaken.' he said. My father was an ass, after all. Be sure of your pedigree before you boast of it. End of section 18 Recording by Jen Bertola in Helsinki, Finland Section 19 of The Aesop for Children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Aesop for Children, Fables 73 to 76 by Aesop. The Fox and the Goat. A fox fell into a well, and though it was not very deep, he found that he could not get out again. After he had been in the well a long time, a thirsty goat came by. The goat thought the fox had gone down to drink, and so he asked if the water was good. The finest in the whole country, said the crafty fox. Jump in and try it. There is more than enough for both of us. The thirsty goat immediately jumped in and began to drink. The fox, just as quickly, jumped on the goat's back and leaped from the tip of the goat's horns out of the well. The foolish goat now saw what a plight he had got into, and begged the fox to help him out, but the fox was already on his way to the woods. "'If you had as much sense as you have beard, old fellow,' he said as he ran, "'you would have been more cautious about finding a way to get out again before you jumped in. Look before you leap.' THE CAT, THE COCK, AND THE YOUNG MOUSE A very young mouse, who had never seen anything of the world, almost came to grief the very first time he ventured out, and this is the story he told his mother about his adventures. I was strolling along very peaceably when... Just as I turned the corner into the next yard, I saw two strange creatures. One of them 
had a very kind and gracious look, but the other was the most fearful monster you can imagine. You should have seen him. On top of his head and in front of his neck hung pieces of raw red meat. He walked about restlessly, tearing up the ground with his toes and beating his arms savagely against his sides. The moment he caught sight of me, he opened his pointed mouth as if to swallow me and then he let out a piercing roar that frightened me almost to death. Can you guess who it was that our young mouse was trying to describe to his mother? It was nobody but the barnyard cock and the first one the little mouse had ever seen. If it had not been for that terrible monster, the mouse went on, I should have made the acquaintance of the pretty creature, who looked so good and gentle. He had thick, velvety fur, a meek face, and a look that was very modest, though his eyes were bright and shining. As he looked at me, he waved his fine long tail and smiled. I am sure he was just about to speak to me when the monster I have told you about let out a screaming yell, and I ran for my life. My son, said the mother mouse, that gentle creature you saw was none other than the cat. Under his kindly appearance he bears a grudge against every one of us. The other was nothing but a bird who wouldn't harm you in the least. As for the cat, he eats us. So be thankful, my child, that you escaped with your life, and as long as you live, never judge people by their looks. Do not trust alone to outward appearances. THE WOLF AND THE SHEPHERD A wolf had been prowling around a flock of sheep for a long time, and the shepherd watched very anxiously to prevent him from carrying off a lamb. But the wolf did not try to do any harm. Instead, he seemed to be helping the shepherd take care of the sheep. At last the shepherd got so used to seeing the wolf about that he forgot how wicked he could be. One day he even went so far as to leave his flock in the wolf's care while he went on an errand. But when he came back and saw how many of the flock had been killed and carried off, he knew how foolish to trust a wolf. Once a wolf, always a wolf. The Peacock and the Crane A peacock, puffed up with vanity, met a crane one day, and to impress him spread his gorgeous tail in the sun. Look, he said, what have you to compare with this? I am dressed in all the glory of the rainbow while your feathers are gray as dust. The crane spread his broad wings and flew up toward the sun. Follow me if you can, he said. But the peacock stood where he was among the birds of the barnyard, while the crane soared in freedom far up into the blue sky. The useful is of much more importance and value than the ornamental. End of section 19. Recording by Susan Morin, Portland, Maine. Section 20 of The Aesop for Children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leslie Wildeson. The Aesop for Children by Aesop. The Farmer and the Cranes. Some cranes saw a farmer plowing a large field. When the work of plowing was done, they patiently watched him sow the seed. It was their feast, they thought. So, as soon as the farmer had finished planting and had gone home, down they flew to the field and began to eat as fast as they could. The farmer, of course, knew the cranes and their ways. He had had experience with such birds before. He soon returned to the field with a sling, but he did not bring any stones with him. He expected to scare the cranes just by swinging the sling in the air and shouting loudly at them. At first the cranes flew away in great terror, but they soon began to see that none of them ever got hurt. They did not even hear the noise of stones whizzing through the air, and, as for words, they would kill nobody. At last they paid no attention whatever to the farmer. The farmer saw that he would have to take other measures. He wanted to save at least some of his grain. So he loaded his sling with stones and killed several of the cranes. This had the effect the farmer wanted, for from that day the cranes visited his field no more. Bluff and threatening words are of little value with rascals. Bluff is no proof that hard fists are lacking. THE FARMER AND HIS SONS A rich old farmer, who felt that he had not many more days to live, called his sons to his bedside. My sons, he said, heed what I have to say to you. Do not on any account part with the estate that has belonged to our family for so many generations. Somewhere on it is hidden a rich treasure. I do not know the exact spot, but it is there, and you will surely find it. Spare no energy, and leave no spot unturned in your search. The father died, and no sooner was he in his grave than the son set to work digging with all their might turning up every foot of ground with their spades, and going over the whole farm two or three times. No hidden gold did they find, but at harvest time, when they had settled their accounts and had pocketed a rich profit far greater than any of their neighbors, they understood that the treasure their father had told them about was the wealth of a bountiful crop, and that in their industry had they found the treasure. Industry is itself a treasure. THE TWO POTS Two pots, one of brass and the other of clay, stood together on the hearthstone. One day the brass pot proposed to the earthen pot that they go out into the world together. But the earthen pot excused himself, saying that it would be wiser for him to stay in the corner by the fire. It would take so little to break me, he said. You know how fragile I am. The least shock is sure to shatter me. Don't let that keep you at home, urged the brass pot. I shall take very good care of you. If we should happen to meet anything hard, I will step between and save you. So the earthen pot at last consented, and the two set out side by side, jolting along on three stubby legs, first to this side, then to that, and bumping into each other at every step. The earthen pot could not survive that sort of companionship very long. They had not gone ten paces before the earthen pot cracked, and at the next jolt 
he flew into a thousand pieces. Equals make the best friends. The Goose and the Golden Egg There was once a countryman who possessed the most wonderful goose you can imagine, for every day when he visited the nest, the goose had laid a beautiful, glittering, golden egg. The countryman took the eggs to market and soon began to get rich. But it was not long before he grew impatient with the goose because she gave him only a single golden egg a day. He was not getting rich fast enough. Then one day, after he had finished counting his money, the idea came to him that he could get all the golden eggs at once by killing the goose and cutting it open. But when the deed was done, not a single golden egg did he find, and his precious goose was dead. Those who have plenty want more, and so lose all they have. End of section 20 Recording by Leslie Wildeson, Portland, Oregon, USA www.arielwarthog.com Section 21 of The Aesop for Children This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deborah Woods. The Aesop for Children by Aesop. The Fighting Bulls and the Frog. Two bulls were fighting furiously in a field, at one side of which was a marsh. An old frog living in the marsh trembled as he watched the fierce battle. What are you afraid of? asked a young frog. Do you not see? replied the old frog that the bull who is beaten will be driven away from the good forage up there to the reeds of this marsh, and we shall all be trampled into the mud. It turned out as the frog had said. The beaten bull was driven to the marsh, where his great hoofs crushed the frogs to death. When the great fall out, the weak must suffer for it. THE FARMER AND THE SNAKE A farmer walked through his field one cold winter morning. On the ground lay a snake, stiff and frozen with the cold. The farmer knew how deadly the snake could be, and yet he picked it up and put it in his bosom to warm it back to life. The snake soon revived, and when it had enough strength, bit the man who had been so kind to it. The bite was deadly, and the farmer felt that he must die. As he drew his last breath, he said to those standing around, Learn from my fate not to take pity on a scoundrel. THE SICK STAG A stag had fallen sick. He had just strength enough to gather some food and find a quiet clearing in the woods, where he lay down to wait until his strength could return. The animals heard about the stag's illness and came to ask after his health. Of course, they were all hungry and helped themselves freely to the stag's food. And, as you would expect, the stag soon starved to death. Good will is worth nothing unless it is accompanied by good acts. THE MOUSE AND THE WEASEL A little hungry mouse found his way one day into a basket of corn. He had to squeeze himself a good deal to get through the narrow opening between the strips of the basket. But the corn was tempting, and the mouse was determined to get in. When at last he had succeeded, he gorged himself to bursting. 
Indeed, he became about three times as big around the middle as he was when he went in. At last he felt satisfied and dragged himself to the opening to get out again. But the best he could do was to get his head out. So there he sat, groaning and moaning, both from the discomfort inside him and his anxiety to escape from the basket. Just then a weasel came by. He understood the situation quickly. My friend, he said, I know what you've been doing. You've been stuffing. That's what you get. You will have to stay here till you feel just like you did when you went in. Good night and good enough for you. And that was all the sympathy the poor mouse got. Greediness leads to misfortune. End of section 21. Recording by Deborah Woods, Saratoga Springs, Utah. Visit my website, Children's Theater Links. Dot org. Section 22 of the Aesop for Children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Genesis Myers. The Spendthrift and the Swallow. A young fellow who was very popular among his boon companions, as a good spender, quickly wasted his fortune trying to live up to his reputation. Then, one fine day in early spring, he found himself with not a penny left and no property save the clothes he wore. He was to meet some jolly young men that morning, and was at his wit's end how to get enough money to keep up appearances. Just then a swallow flew by, twittering merrily, and the young man, thinking summer had come, hastened off to a clothes dealer, whom he sold all the clothes that he wore, down to his very tunic. A few days later, a change in weather brought a severe frost, and the poor swallow, and that foolish young man, in his light tunic, with his arms and knees bare, could scarcely keep the life and their shivering bodies. One swallow does not make a summer. The cat and the birds. A cat was growing very thin. As you have guessed, he did not get enough to eat. One day he heard that some birds in the neighborhood were ailing and needed a doctor. So he put on a pair of spectacles and with a leather box in his hand, knocked at the door of the bird's home. The birds peeped out, and Dr. Cat, with much solicitude, asked how they were. He would be very happy to give them some medicine. Tweet, tweet, laughed the birds. Very smart, aren't you? We are very well, thank you, and more so, if you only keep away from here. Be wise and shun the quack. The dog and the oyster. There once was a dog who was very fond of eggs. He visited the hen house very often, and at last got so greedy that he would swallow the eggs whole. One day, the dog wandered down to the seashore. There he spied an oyster. In a twinkling, the oyster was resting in the dog's stomach, shell and all. It pained the dog a good deal, as you can guess. I've learned that all round things are not eggs, he said, groaning. Act in haste and repent at leisure, and often in pain. The Astrologer A man who lived a long time ago believed that he could read the future in the stars. He called himself an astrologer and spent his time at night gazing at the sky. One evening... He was walking along the open road outside the village. His eyes were fixed on the stars. He thought he saw there that the end of the world was at hand, when all at once down he went into a hole full of mud and water. 
There he stood up to his ears in the muddy water and madly clawing at the slippery sides of the hole in his effort to climb out. His cries for help soon brought the villagers running. As they pulled him out of the mud, one of them said, You pretend to read the future in the stars, and yet you fail to see what is at your feet. This may teach you to pay more attention to what's right in front of you, and let the future take care of itself. What use is it, said another, to read the stars when you can't see what's right here on earth? Take care of the little things, and the big things will take care of themselves. End of section 22. Recording by Genesis Myers. Section 23 of The Aesop for Children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Aesop for Children. Fables 89 to 92 by Aesop. Three Bullocks and a Lion. A lion had been watching three bullocks feeding in an open field. He had tried to attack them several times, but they had kept together and helped each other to drive him off. The lion had little hope of eating them, for he was no match for three strong bullocks with their sharp horns and hooves. But he could not keep away from that field, for it is hard to resist watching a good meal, even when there is little chance of getting it. Then one day the bullocks had a quarrel, and when the hungry lion came to look at them and lick his chops as he was accustomed to do, he found them in separate corners of the field, as far away from one another as they could get. It was now an easy matter for the lion to attack them one at a time, and this he proceeded to do with the greatest satisfaction and relish. In unity is strength. Mercury and the Woodman A poor woodman was cutting down a tree near the edge of a deep pool in the forest. It was late in the day, and the woodman was tired. He had been working since sunrise, and his strokes were not so sure as they had been early that morning. Thus it happened that the axe slipped and flew out of his hands into the pool. The woodman was in despair. The axe was all he possessed with which to make a living, and he had not money enough to buy a new one. As he stood wringing his hands and weeping, the god Mercury suddenly appeared and asked what the trouble was. The woodman told what had happened, and straight away the kind Mercury dived into the pool. When he came up again he held a wonderful golden axe. "'Is this your axe?' Mercury asked the woodman. "'No,' answered the honest woodman. "'That is not my axe.' Mercury laid the golden axe on the bank and sprang back into the pool. This time he brought up an axe of silver, but the woodman declared again that his axe was just an ordinary one with a wooden handle. Mercury dived down for the third time, and when he came up again he had the very axe that had been lost. The poor woodman was very glad that his axe had been found, and could not thank the kind god enough. Mercury was greatly pleased with the woodman's honesty. I admire your honesty, he said, and as a reward you may have all three axes, the gold and the silver as well as your own. The happy woodman returned home with his treasures and soon the story of his good fortune was known to everybody in the village. Now there were several woodmen in the village who believed that they could easily win the same good fortune. 
they hurried out into the woods one here one there and hiding their axes in the bushes pretended they had lost them then they wept and wailed and called on mercury to help them and indeed mercury did appear first to this one then to that to each one he showed an axe of gold and each one eagerly claimed it to be the one he had lost but mercury did not give them the golden axe oh no instead he gave them each a hard whack over the head with it and sent them home and when they returned next day to look for their own axes they were nowhere to be found honesty is the best policy the frog and the mouse a young mouse in search of adventure was running along the bank of a pond where lived a frog when the frog saw the mouse he swam to the bank and croaked won't you pay me a visit i can promise you a good time if you do the mouse did not need much coaxing for he was very anxious to see the world and everything in it but though he could swim a little he did not dare risk going into the pond without some help the frog had a plan he tied the mouse's leg to his own with a tough reed then into the pond he jumped dragging his foolish companion with him the mouse soon had enough of it and wanted to return to shore but the treacherous frog had other plans he pulled the mouse down under the water and drowned him but before he could untie the reed that bound him to the dead mouse a hawk came sailing over the pond seeing the body of the mouse floating on the water the hawk swooped down seized the mouse and carried it off with the frog dangling from its leg thus at one swoop he had caught both meat and fish for his dinner those who seek to harm others often come to harm themselves through their own deceit the fox and the crab a crab one day grew disgusted with the sands in which he lived he decided to take a stroll to the meadow not far inland there he would find better fare than briny water and sand mites so off he crawled to the meadow but there a hungry fox spied him and in a twinkling ate him up both shell and claw be content with your lot end of section twenty three recording by susan morin portland maine section twenty four of the aesop for children this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Aesop for Children, Fables 93-96, to 96, by Aesop. The Serpent and the Eagle a serpent had succeeded in surprising an eagle and had wrapped himself around the eagle's neck the eagle could not reach the serpent neither with beak nor claws far into the sky he soared trying to shake off his enemy but the serpent's hold only tightened and slowly the eagle sank back to earth gasping for breath a countryman chanced to see the unequal combat in pity for the noble eagle he rushed up and soon had loosened the coiling serpent and freed the eagle the serpent was furious he had no chance to bite the watchful countryman instead he struck at the drinking horn hanging at the countryman's belt and into it let fly the poison of his fangs 
the countryman now went on toward home becoming thirsty on the way he filled his horn at a spring and was about to drink there was a sudden rush of great wings sweeping down the eagle seized the poison horn from out his saviour's hands and flew away with it to hide it where it could never be found an act of kindness is well repaid the wolf in sheep's clothing a certain wolf could not get enough to eat because of the watchfulness of the shepherds but one night he found a sheepskin that had been cast aside and forgotten the next day dressed in the skin the wolf strolled into the pasture with the sheep soon a little lamb was following him about and was quickly led away to slaughter that evening the wolf entered the fold with the flock but it happened that the shepherd took a fancy for mutton broth that very evening and picking up a knife went to the fold there the first he laid hands on and killed was the wolf the evil doer often comes to harm through his own deceit the bull and the goat a bull once escaped from a lion by entering a cave which the goat herds used to house their flocks in stormy weather and at night it happened that one of the goats had been left behind and the bull had no sooner got inside than this goat lowered his head and made a rush at him butting him with his horns as the lion was still prowling outside the entrance to the cave the bull had to submit to the insult do not think he said that i submit to your cowardly treatment because i am afraid of you when that lion leaves i'll teach you a lesson you won't forget it is wicked to take advantage of another's distress the eagle and the beetle a beetle once begged the eagle to spare a hare which had run to her for protection but the eagle pounced upon her prey the sweep of her great wings tumbling the beetle a dozen feet away furious at the disrespect shown her the beetle flew to the eagle's nest and rolled out the eggs not one did she spare the eagle's grief and anger knew no bounds but who had done the cruel deed she did not know next year the eagle built her nest far up on a mountain crag but the beetle found it and again destroyed the eggs in despair the eagle now implored great jupiter to let her place her eggs in his lap there none would dare harm them but the beetle buzzed about jupiter's head and made him rise to drive her away and the eggs rolled from his lap now the beetle told the reason for her action and jupiter had to acknowledge the justice of her cause and they say that ever after while the eagle's eggs lie in the nest in spring the beetle still sleeps in the ground for so jupiter commanded even the weakest may find means to avenge a wrong. End of section 24 Recorded by Susan Morin, Portland, Maine Section 25 of The Aesop for Children This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Ingle The Aesop for Children by Aesop The Old Lion and the Fox 
an old lion whose teeth and claws were so worn that it was not so easy for him to get food as in his younger days, pretended that he was sick. He took care to let all his neighbors know about it, and then lay down in his cave to wait for visitors. And when they came to offer him their sympathy, he ate them up one by one. The fox came, too, but he was very cautious about it. Standing at a safe distance from the cave, he inquired politely after the lion's health. The lion replied that he was very ill indeed, and asked the fox to step in for a moment. But Master Fox very wisely stayed outside, thanking the lion very kindly for the invitation. "'I should be glad to do as you ask,' he added. "'But I have noticed that there are many footprints leading into your cave, and none coming out. Pray tell me, how do your visitors find their way out again? Take warning from the misfortunes of others. The Man and the Lion A lion and a man chanced to travel in company through the forest. They soon began to quarrel, for each of them boasted that he and his kind were far superior to the other both in strength and mind. Now they reached a clearing in the forest, and there stood a statue. It was the representation of Hercules in the act of tearing the jaws of the Nemean lion. See, said the man, that's how strong we are. The king of beasts is like wax in our hands. Ho! Oh, laughed the lion. A man made that statue. It would have been quite a different scene had a lion made it. It all depends on the point of view, and who tells the story. THE ASS AND THE LAPDOG There was once an ass whose master also owned a lapdog. This dog was a favorite, and received many a pat and kind word from his master, as well as choice bits from his plate. Every day the dog would run to meet the master, frisking playfully about and leaping up to lick his hands and face. All this the ass saw with much discontent. Though he was well fed, he had much work to do. Besides, the master hardly ever took any notice of him. Now the jealous ass got it into his silly head that all he had to do to win his master's favor was to act like the dog. So one day he left his stable and clattered eagerly into the house. Finding his master seated at the dinner table, he kicked up his heels and with a loud bray pranced giddily around the table, upsetting it as he did so. Then. He planted his four feet on the master's knees and rolled out his tongue to lick the master's face, as he had seen the dog do. But his weight upset the chair, and ass and man rolled over together in the pile of broken dishes from the table. The master was much alarmed at the strange behavior of the ass, and calling for help soon attracted the attention of the servants. When they saw the danger the master was in from the clumsy beast, they set upon the ass and drove him with kicks and blows back to the stable. There they left him to mourn the foolishness that had brought him nothing but a sound beating. Behavior that is regarded as agreeable in one is very rude and impertinent in another. Do not try to gain favor by acting in a way that is contrary to your own nature and character. THE MILKMAID AND HER PAIL a milkmaid had been out to milk the cows, and was returning from the field with the shining milk-pail, balanced nicely on her head. As she walked along, her pretty head was busy with plans for the days to come. "'This good rich milk,' she mused, "'will give me plenty of cream to churn. The butter I make I will take to the market, and with the money I get for it I will buy a lot of eggs for hatching. How nice it will be when they are all hatched and the yard is full of fine young chicks!' Then, when May Day comes, I will sell them, and with the money I'll buy a lovely new dress to wear to the fair. All the young men will look at me. They will come and try to make love to me, but I shall very quickly send them about their business. As she thought of how she would settle that matter, she tossed her head scornfully, and down fell the pail of milk to the ground, and all the milk flowed out, and with it vanished butter, and eggs, and chicks, and new dress and all the milkmaid's pride. Do not count your chickens before they are hatched. End of section 25